Well, hi, I'm Scott. I'm one of the pastors here at Marco Presbyterian Church, and these sermons are meant to be used in conjunction with a local church body. I want to encourage you to plug in somewhere, and if you're not, please join us. Connect right here on Marco Island at Marco Church. We love the Bible, and right now we're in the book of Romans, the foundations of faith. And so here we are, preaching through Romans verse by verse. Well, good morning. It's great to see you all again. We are going to be in the book of Romans, so if you have a Bible Bible in front of you or on your device, you'll want to go there. Uh, It's on page 1,120, and I'm glad that we use this video. Uh, Gene is the one who puts this together. It's so, I think, uh, it, it makes an impression on us that what we're doing is, in fact, reading a book written directly to a people, and we can still see the ruins of that civilization We know that they were there. We know that the gospel was necessary to be delivered to a people who actually lived, and the exact same situation is true today. There are people who live here, and in fact, our own lives, what we want to do as we've been diving into the book of Romans is make sure that the foundations of our faith are firm, that they're steadfast, that they're solid and trustworthy. And that's what we've been doing in the book of Romans. And so today we're jumping into Romans chapter 5 so that we can learn a little bit more about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope that you've seen that that is our big deal here. We want to make the main thing the main thing, and that's our main thing. It's hard to admit, uh, it's hard hard to deny today that uh, President Vladimir Putin represents the Russian people today. I was in Tel Aviv uh, a couple of weeks ago and my kids love soccer, so I went into a convenience store pretty close to the hotel to try to get my kids soccer jerseys from Israel, and the the kind woman who owned the store helped me to find exactly the right sizes, and as she was helping, I could tell she's probably Russian, or at least speaks Russian and is from a Russian-speaking nation, and so I gently asked, are you Russian? And she said, I am Russian, but that is not my Russia. And she went on to, as as she checked out and and I paid for the jerseys, she said uh, to me that she's embarrassed. And she thinks that Vladimir Putin should not be the president. It's, It's difficult as a Russian to get around the reality that anywhere in the world today, it's, it's in fact Vladimir Putin who represents what is Russia on the world stage. And the opposite is also true of Zelensky, President Vladimir Zelensky, who's uh, a younger man, a former um, actor. He was an actor before he became president of Ukraine, and today he represents the country of Ukraine on the world stage. There is this idea built into our humanity that others can, in fact, represent our family. If you're an individual and you're out, your name is connected to your family. You're representing your family. There are types. In fact, uh, you can look at our windows. There are, these are types. Jesus is a, a shepherd. The Holy Spirit is something like a dove. You can see the, the different types written into the Bible as well. And what we'll see today is, in fact, something that will help us to build more firmly our foundation of faith. And the question for you, even as we uh, read Romans chapter 5, is that uh, which, which one is your representative? We're going to ask the question, is it Adam 
or is it Jesus? And we know that Ro uh, Paul has been addressing the Romans. He's been trying to encourage them, and particularly here in Romans chapter 5, he's trying to encourage them and remind them what Jesus has done for them and for us. And so uh, it's verse 11 that Pastor Steve read for us at the very beginning of the service, and we read together that through Jesus, through our Lord Jesus, we can rejoice. We can, in fact, be covered by his righteousness. It's the very last verse of chapter 5, verse 21, that we also find out that we can reign, and in fact, grace abounds to us in Christ Jesus. And so let's stand up and read Romans chapter 5 and encourage you to have a Bible if you can and read along with me. We'll be sort of reading verse by verse today. The text will be up on the screen as well. And the question as we read through this text for you is, are you in Adam or are you in Christ? Let's read Romans chapter 5 beginning at verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the, gift, the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous now the law came in to increase the trespasses, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated and I'll pray for us because this is a big chunky stake of Bible and we're going to need God's help. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful that we can openly read your word in freedom. Father, we're grateful that we can rejoice in your Son, Jesus Christ. And God, we do pray that you would illumine our minds, would you open our eyes, so that we could see you more clearly and what you've done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that your Spirit would move now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is a tough text, and what we've just read is a comparison and contrast. And so it would be helpful today, especially in most days anyway, if you have your Bible open, because we'll walk through each of the different verses here. What this verse, this, this passage is doing for us is, is in, a, in a, you know, Pauline way, throwing right in our faces the reality of death. And I write... Here, uh, Pastor Steve pointed out earlier, these flowers and, and a celebration yesterday of our friend and brother and father, uh, Bruce Hillenbrand. He was a man of God. He was a man that we get to celebrate his life. He's now with his uh, beloved in heaven. And what we get to know is that he is a man, we'll see, who viewed death as a believer in Jesus. There, there are three different things that we can learn really quickly just from the first three verses in our text today. So look at verse 12. It says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. So right away we just see first in the beginning, after Adam sinned, that death became a reality for everybody. The Bible verse says, all died because all sinned, because of Adam. And second, in verse 13, you can see this, you read along, it says, For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, that was given to Moses, but sin 
is not counted where there is no law. That is to say that even before the law was given to Moses, that time from Adam all the way to Moses, what was still reigning? Death. Why? Because of sin. So what we see, thirdly, in verse 14, is yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. But then pay attention to this last phrase. It says this, Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So because of Adam, all sin and all die. Even before Moses received the law, death still reigned. But Adam was a type of one who was to come. And so already from the beginning, we learn a bunch about why things happen, and uh, especially about Adam. And you might be saying this, in fact, it's not fair that Adam represented all mankind, and because of Adam's sin, I have to suffer the consequences. That's a good question. That's not fair. And that is, in fact, what I think of most often. He's a bad representative. Why did Adam get to represent mankind, and why did he sin, and why do I have to bear the consequences of, of his sin? Well, that, that is, in fact, what happened. And you may ask yourself, maybe I could have done a better job. I don't know, do you think you could have done a better job representing mankind at the very beginning? You can remember, who was Adam? Adam was a guy that named everything that was made, and yet he knew God intimately and personally and still broke God's commandment. I think that probably we would have done the same thing. You may not think it's fair, but Adam was our representative. But this text, in fact, gives us a glimpse of hope because Adam wasn't the end. Adam was a type of the one who was to come. He represented us. He, because of his sin, uh, we sin, but he was a type. You see, Noah was a type of Savior. Um, David was a type of king. Isaiah was a type of prophet. Melchizedek was a, a, a type of priest. And you've seen the windows. We have pictures that help us see more clearly. You could even go so far as to say that the, 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 the holidays, the, the Passover, the, um, even the, the bread and the wine and the waters of baptism, they are pictures for us. They're helping us to know God himself. From the beginning all the way to the maps, the Bible is about Jesus. And unless you don't grasp that, unless you grasp that fact, what you'll do is you'll miss and get stuck on things that aren't the main thing. What we want to do is to make the main thing the main thing. They all point to Jesus. And the question for you and I from this text is who's your representative? Who is your representative? Your hope is, in fact, your believed-in future, what you think will happen to you. That's your hope. What you really believe will happen to you one day is, is what you can call your hope. And here's then the, the thrust, the main thrust of this text this morning is that either you're in Adam and your hoped for, your believed-in future is, in fact, death, or you're in Christ and your believed-in or your hope for the future is death and then life, death and then resurrection. And so what we want to see from the uh, verse 15 going forward is then what is our hope? Well, look at verse 15. You can see the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ abounded for many. In fact, in this section, 15, 16, and 17, the two words free gift is mentioned five times, and then further abounding grace or overflowing or even super abounding grace is mentioned twice. And so what you want to know is that this is about grace. And first, a real quick kitty version of what's grace. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. I need the kid version, so that helps me. But you can know, too, that it's more than you deserve. God's grace is more than you deserve. Second, the grace of God is a free gift. Again, mentioned five different times right there. And finally, Christ is 
our one man. So while Adam was the man who brought condemnation, Christ is the one who brings righteousness. That's verse 15. Verse 16, we can see, in fact, that Christ repaired what Adam broke. This is what verse 16 said, and the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. You see that what has happened is that because of Adam's brokenness, sin reigned, and then death came in, and we served, even even always could uh, know that our believed-in future was death. But now because of Christ, he has brought us life. Adam acted and brought condemnation, but Jesus acted and brought righteousness. This is verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in Adam, and our hope is not in fixing Adam's mistakes. Simply put, our hope is in Christ. Our mistakes are there, we're present. How, how, can, how can hope then be ours? We'll look at verse 17 again, and you know again that the free gift is mentioned five times. So in the Bible, if something's mentioned repeatedly, you should pay attention. And we know that the, the word for abundance of grace is in fact hard to translate. It means super abundance or super abounding or overflowing. What is it? It's a free gift. So here's, here's what's happening is that sometimes that, that gift is, uh, is, is something, it's sitting under a tree, but you've got to receive the free gift. And so here's the main thrust of our text. Because Christ is our hope, Christians reign in Christ. So if, if Adam is your representative, then what's reigning? It's death and sin. And that will continue to reign in your life if you're only in Adam. But the option here, the free gift, the gift of righteousness, the superabounding grace that's given to us is Christ himself. And so if you're in Christ, you are in Adam and you still suffer the consequences of sin. But if you're in Christ, We'll read this later in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation. That gift is sitting there under the tree. Because Christ is our hope, Christians reign in Christ. You could say it like this. We no longer flounder in our founder, Adam, but instead what we do is we reign in Christ. So how do we reign? How can we, in fact, reign in Christ? I think three different things that we can learn from this section. First is to acknowledge our ruin or the fact that we're a wreck. And there are two different types of ruinous wrecks, and that is the first one, which is our inherited sin. And the second one is, our, in fact, our personal sin. And it, it just happens to be a unique opportunity to make fun of the name Putin. Today, um, the name Putin actually is partly uh, from the English word, which means if you're in Adam, you have an imputed unrighteousness. Your, your sin nature is fallen and so you're, in fact, if you're in Adam, shown to be or counted because of Adam's imputed sin in you and I. That's where we live. Because all have fallen short of the glory of God, we are all sinners. The result, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is what? It's death. Our kids are learning these verses, and we want them to create the foundations of their faith to know the reality. Why is there war and brokenness and cancer? Sin and death reigning. But there's hope, and there's hope in Christ. Again, the name Putin, maybe it'll help you remember. I don't know. It might help me remember. But the word uh, to uh, help us understand better how we are given righteousness, and I love that song that Matt has written that helps us to see that Christ is all our righteousness. It is imputed to us. It is given to us by Christ, by faith in Jesus Christ alone. How does that happen? It happens because of the Holy Spirit binding us to the person of Christ. So back to the question, are you in Adam or are you in Jesus? The first step along the way here would be to acknowledge our ruin. The second step, though, would be to receive 
that free gift of redemption. And we've seen that, again, illustrated five different times right here in 15, 16, and 17. Then as you scan back through there, you know that in order to uh, open up a gift, you've got to receive it. It's got to be yours. You have to take it and open it up and receive that gift. And that's the point being communicated here by Paul to the Roman people and to you and to me. That in order for you to reign in Christ, to receive that superabounding grace, you need to receive the gift of redemption. And what does that mean? Simply put here, you place your faith in Christ. You believe that you're a sinner and that you believe in Jesus' righteousness to cover your sin. Are you in Adam or are you in Christ? The difference between the two is have you placed your faith in Jesus alone? Or you might be one who places your faith in something else, like working really hard to be really good, or your career, or your wealth, or your family. Those are all possible opportunities for you to try to make up for the place where we end up, or the place where we begin, which is in Adam. But the gospel is, in fact, that that free gift of righteousness is for you and I to receive, to believe in Jesus. Here, here it is in a, in a, a chart form or a, a comparison contrast, because by the disobedience of one man, Adam, we are counted or constituted sinners, says the text. But by the obedience of Christ alone, we are counted or constituted righteous. That word keeps coming back up, and remember that that word righteous doesn't mean doing good things or behaving rightly. That word righteous, especially in the book of Romans, means right standing with God himself. So when we use the word like we did at the beginning of the service, reconciliation, to believe in Jesus means to be reconciled, to be redeemed, to be made right, to be given a right standing with God himself. And so we, when we sing... Christ is all our righteousness, what we're doing is celebrating the redemption, the reconciliation, the restoration through Christ alone. And so what we do is we, we in fact, rest on him. And remember that what we, um, at the beginning, there's a lot of talk about death, and we're thinking about Bruce Hillenbrand, his celebration of life yesterday. That's, that's difficult to consider, and it's raw when we're, in fact, celebrating a friend, a father, and a brother. But the way that we think about death influences heavily the way that we live our lives now. That is to say that what you hope, what, what, what is your true hope? What's your hope for the rest of your life or the hope for the very end of your life? What Tim Keller says is your believed in future. What do you think will really happen? Well, you can in fact look at your life. It's kind of scary sometimes. Make sure you're alone and, and with the Lord, but look at your life and then try to, from your life, define what you really think will happen. Because you're believed in future, where you think you're going determines what you're doing today. And so how you embrace or deal with death, in fact, does influence how you live today. And uh, the beginning of that question would be, who's your representative? Are you in Adam? Or are you in Christ? A professor and theologian uh, friend is Dan Doriani, and he gave me these three categories that I want to use today. And the question at the front end is, are you dying or living? And here are the three different categories that he uses. The, because the first one, they, they, they sort of help us to lay out three approaches to death, the way that we process these. The first one is death accepting. And death acceptors, a culture who accepts death, results in people who sort of rush toward death without really uh, too much fear. You might think kamikaze pilot from World War II, or the, the Greeks believed that the, the body was just a container for the soul. And so what ended up happening is that when you died, in fact, your soul was freed. And so people rush toward death a little bit more quickly. Think Socrates or uh, Caesar. And so what ends up happening is that we, we often, um, and, and this happens in our culture, those who are death accepting, they, they just want to free the soul. But then there's another kind of, of death processing, which is a death denier. And death deniers are people who they, they put off or reject death as long as they can. These are 
These are people who, and I, I, I think I do this, I, I cover up or I try to repair or um, I, I, you know, I, I uh, avoid the degradation of my body as long as possible for the purpose of living longer. And sometimes out of good motivation, I want to be at my daughter's marriages. I, you know, I want to, I want to help my sons um, choose wives well. I want to see my grand... Those are good. I think those are good things to do. But what ends up happening in a death-denying culture is that, that we idolize youth. And we idolize um, exercise and diet. Why? So that we can live a little bit longer. But then that, that ends up being a selfish pursuit. We don't want to live a little bit longer like Paul. He says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But rather what we say is, for me to live is get a little more me time. <laughs> and so there's either death accepting or there's death denying. And remember, how we, how we deal with death influences our life. What, what Christians are, are people who are death defying. I think Bruce Hillenbrand was a death defier. I think he knew that death was coming. He was almost home, you might say, but he also knew that while he was here, he could spread hope. Death defiers are the ones who say, though we may die, we will live. Death defiers are the ones that say, even at the threat of pain or suffering, we're, we're going to press in. We're going to show compassion and love and fight for good. And as a result, in fact, what happens is that we live. In fact, we live full lives. You might say lives abundant. Death defiers are the ones who uh, pack up a field hospital and fly directly to Poland right into the midst of danger so that people can be cared for. Death defiers are the people who say, no, Jesus is the most important thing, so we're going to, we're going to get rid of barriers so that people can see Jesus. That, that's what we've tried to say here at Marco Presbyterian Church. In fact, there, I don't know if you remember this, there used to be a barrier. You remember that? A little lip on the edge of the platform. We, we literally, physically took the barrier down so that it didn't get in the way of people feeling welcome to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to lower the barriers because if the barrier is there, we want it to be Jesus. Not a song, not a pattern, not a tradition, not a, I think it was about eight inches, not a wall. Death defiers are people who walk into and see Jesus as most important. And so if someone is grieving or suffering, they walk into the relationship. They sit in the midst of the awkwardness and difficulty. And we have a group of people here called Stephen Ministers who do that very thing. In fact, they offer themselves as death defiers walking into the midst of difficult situations for the purpose of healing and wholeness. If you want to be a person who walks with a Stephen Minister because you feel like you might be suffering or struggling from a, uh, the death of a spouse or a loss of a child, you can, in fact, uh, sign up and, and just go and meet Marge Beasley at the Connect Center. And there are several Stephen ministers who are, in fact, right now waiting for another person just to simply walk with toward wholeness and healing. Gracious living means death-defying. You can either be gracious, uh, death-accepting, you can be death-denying, or you can be a Christian, and you can be death-defying. You can live right into the midst of the pain and death that is the result of Adam, even while Christ is all your righteousness, and live into the midst of the pain for his sake, so that people might know Jesus. And so because Christ is our hope, what we want to do is reign in Christ, we reign in Christ by confessing, repenting of our ruin and our wreckage. We also reign in Christ by, by receiving the gift of redemption, by believing in Jesus. And we reign in Christ by living graciously as death defiers. If you're Russian today, it's an uncomfortable and awkward thing because Vladimir Putin is your representative. But what we can know is that no matter who you are, no matter where you are, you could be in Russia listening to this for all we know, you can reign in Christ by believing in Jesus 
himself and being a death defier. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we're grateful that we can, in fact, live this reality out right here. Yet wrestling with our brokenness, our sin, and rebellion against you, but we rest in Christ alone. And so, Father, we pray that even as we continue to worship you through song, as we sing, Come Thou Fount and Amazing Grace, Father, we pray that you'd be glorified in us and through us. That we, we would be a people who reign in Christ as we, Father, embrace Jesus as our Savior and by your Spirit as you continue to work within us. Father, we pray that you would help us to be then representatives of you to a world who needs hope. Father, would you make us people who give you the glory and honor in everything that we do. And we pray indeed, Father, that you would not only reign in us, but that you'd be glorified in us and through us. It's in Jesus' name we pray.